Welcome to Dietetics After Dark, your source for food-related crime, scandal, and fraud. All right. Hi, Becca. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm well as well. We've had a crazy week. Yes, we have. Our master's program is finishing up its first semester, Mm -hmm. so it's been a bit crazy. Thank goodness. I was just telling Sarah that I still have my pajama pants on. (laughs) Yeah. And I was just saying that I transferred from my nighttime sweatpants to my daytime sweatpants, (laughs) which are just less stained and they don't have a hole. (laughs) So yesterday I was wearing pajamas the entire day and I did take some breaks from studying. I did yoga and I went outside and took Rosie for a walk. And at the end of the day, I was like, I was wearing my PJs this whole time. (laughs) Out in public on a walk. Wow. Yeah. It's that time of year. We're almost done. Yeah. The first semester. I know. Oh my gosh. I've, I told like a couple people that I was like, oh yeah, I'm done school this week. And they're all like, oh my God, congrats. What's your next step? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm done my first semester. Yeah, the next semester is next. <laughs> yeah. Anything else happen this week? I was just about to tell you <laughs> one other thing that happened to me and you actually will remember part of this now because I haven't told you this okay. yet. But remember when you texted me and then you texted me the next day being like, I don't think you got my text. Yeah. So my phone wasn't working for three days. Yeah. And I wasn't aware because I'm home all the time now. So I'm connected to Wi Fi. So I can make, like, I can FaceTime people and I'm still getting like my iMessages and stuff. So I didn't even like clue into what was happening. But it turns out that somebody had stolen my phone number (gasps) and transferred it over to a different phone company, changed all of my information. And was essentially using it or trying to, luckily nothing got stolen that I'm aware of yet, but they were trying to use it so that they could change my passwords. Oh my gosh. So, you know, when they, like that second authenticator thing happens, I don't know if it's called the second authenticator, but when you have to essentially verify through text message that it's you. Yeah. Apparently it's a new scam that's happening. Oh my gosh. Okay. First of all, yeah. So when you're, when I knew that text didn't go through to you, it was because it went to your email. And so now you're not, you're no longer Becca in my phone. You're your email address. <laughs> like I don't have your contact saved anymore, which is, but that's so, okay. First of all, I'm sorry that happened. That's like pretty that's scary, <laughs> but that's good to know and good to share because if you're texting someone and all of a sudden their phone number switches to the email, that could be a red flag. For sure. Cause I had no idea for, for three days until I, I did notice the second day. And then I was like, Oh, I'll deal with this tomorrow. Cause we were in classes that day. And I didn't have time to sit on the phone with my phone company for three hours, but I ended up figuring it out and that's, that's what had happened. So luckily I was able to stop it before. How did you stop it? So I called my phone company and they said, Oh, you transferred your number like three days ago. And I was like, no, I didn't. No. Uh, so they were like, oh, okay, we're just going to put you on a quick hold. And they investigated. And then they came back and they were like, oh, so you didn't transfer your number to X, Y, and Z phone company. And I was like, no. And I was like, did somebody call in and do this? And they said that, no, they're able to do it online. So if they can get your password for your phone company, I don't know how they did this. They can wow. essentially say that they want to switch your phone number to a different provider and they don't actually have to do it over the phone where you have to provide like your, I don't know, your birth date or some other identifier. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's scary. Yeah. So that's, that's what's been happening here the last couple of, uh, wow. (laughs) Well, I think that light fraud is a good segue to our first light fraud. (laughs) I think so too. I feel like this podcast is all about fraud these days. I know. It's actually a perfect segue from last week's episode. No, it really is. Let's dive right in. Let's do it. I'm ready. Are you ready? Okay. I'm ready. The information in this podcast is for entertainment and educational purposes only. If you're interested in medical nutrition therapy or personalized nutrition advice, please talk to a registered dietitian in your area. All the citations and relevant links for anything mentioned in this episode will be in our show notes. This podcast may contain coarse language, mature subject matter, and content of a violent or disturbing nature. Listener discretion is advised. So Sarah, you asked me to look up a couple instances of what's called substitution. 
Mm -hmm. which was something that we discussed last week when I was talking about food fraud. So remember that with food fraud, food may be intentionally misrepresented many different ways, one of which was through substituting a product with something of a different character or quality. So essentially, this is when something in the product isn't disclosed on the label. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk about an instance that is, I guess, more like two instances of potential substitution that made it really big in the news a few years ago. But first, I have a question for you. Okay. Do you eat hot dogs? Do I eat hot dogs? Yeah. Not often. Really not often. The last time I had a hot dog, I think I was camping, like over the fire. A Spidey dog? A Spidey dog or a Bart Simpson. <laughs> Did you oh. ever do a Bart Simpson? No. What's that? It's just when you cut the top of the hot dog so it's spiky like Bart's hair. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and then when you roast it, it just gets spiky and hard. <laughs> that's really cute. I think that's the last time I had a hot dog. That's That's fair. What about you? Not like I don't really eat hot dog, hot dogs that often. Yeah. Like maybe like a chicken sausage or even like a veggie mm -hmm. dog sometimes. Totally. I definitely have had more veggie dogs mm -hmm. in the past couple of years. Okay. And what's your favorite hot dog topping? Oh, um, like everything that they would have at the stand on a, of a Toronto street hot dog. Like the hickory sticks? Hickory sticks, mayo, banana peppers, like all the things... Not the classic toppings. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Have you ever had a Toronto street dog? Um, not to my knowledge. <laughs> it's you only have them post bar, but they're like, they're so good. Mm -hmm. I swear they're the best street dogs. Well, that's good. Good to know. Uh, but now I'm going to just talk to you about a couple instances of substitution that do occur with hot dogs. And they were so unusual and disturbing that I really wanted to share them with you. And I know that it initially did have me kind of rethinking every time that I ate a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That being said, most of the information that I am sharing today was uncovered first by Snopes, which I had no idea up until a couple of weeks ago when our university librarian told us that it's an investigatory fact checking source. Yeah. I had no idea either. It doesn't sound like like Snopes. It sounds like it would be like a, I don't know, like a vice or something like that. But mm -hmm. it's good to know. It's a legit source. It's great to know because they have a lot of amazing information on there. Cool. Mm -hmm. I should also mention that I did try to find the original source of the information that I'm going to share today from the company uh, called Clear Labs Inc., but the mm -hmm. webpage no longer exists. So I don't know if this is because the information that they shared was proven inaccurate or if there was some like industry stuff going on behind the scenes that made them take it down. Interesting. But regardless, it's a little bit strange, just something to keep in mind. But anyways, Clear Labs is a food safety lab and their website claims that you can rely on them for the most accurate and advanced food safety testing. So it sounds like it would be a legitimate source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So both of these cases of food substitution and their subsequent news reporting were due to a single report released by Clear Labs in 2015. So I don't know if you remember this, but there were a ton of headlines claiming that 10% of vegetarian hot dogs actually contain meat. I do remember you this. You do remember this? Yeah, So do I. Sure. It, was a, it was a big one. Mm -hmm. So... Clear Labs, who released this information, they analyzed 345 hot dogs and sausages from 75 brands and found that 14.4% were considered problematic. And I say this <laughs> with air quotes. <laughs> uh, they found that 10% of veggie dogs did in fact contain some meat and that some kosher hot dogs included some traces of pork. Aw. Uh. Mm-hmm. So they claim that chicken was found in 10 samples, beef was found in four samples, turkey in three samples, and lamb in two samples. And based on this evidence alone, it would seem like they had done their research because they're giving you a breakdown of the different types of cells that were found in the products. And for all we know, based on the media coverage, they are a legitimate food lab. Mm -hmm. What's worse is that they claimed to have found human DNA in 2% of the hot dog samples as well. Two thirds of that which, is worse. It is so much That's worse. A lot worse. So much worse. Um, and two thirds of these ones were veggie dogs. And this was claimed to likely be due to poor hygiene practices versus something like a dead body being added to the hot dog meat. 
But honestly, I don't know which one sounds more disgusting. I The dead body. Does it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just never eating hot dogs again. <laughs> I know. It's pretty gross. Mm-hmm. Okay. The 75 brands that were tested came from 10 different retailers. So they were mainly very large organizations with multiple brands that worked under them. But Clear Labs did fail to mention which brands had been tainted with meat. So both animal Mm. or human. Um, Now, this is kind of where I get my feelers up. Like Like, why wouldn't they disclose the names of the brands that were partaking in these instances of food fraud or neglect? For sure. It's just, it's very suspicious that they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Seems like a key piece of information, especially if they want any action to be taken. Absolutely. Which makes you kind of question their motives. Yes. Anyways, upon looking into this further, these claims seem to have been made without any transparency as to how they determined the numbers that they published, what types of testing they did, whether their claims could be backed up, or what their objectives in releasing this information might be but I can tell you what I think their motivation may have been. Okay. So around the same time this hot dog report came out, which was October 2015, they started a Kickstarter campaign to raise money for Clear Food, which was what they called their consumer initiative for Clear Labs, Inc. Okay. So their claim was that they can discover hidden additives, trace allergens, and unintended ingredients in consumer products. And... In the campaign description, it mentioned like the contents of the hot dog report. So like what happened in it, like the information I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. They also mentioned how they measure the makeup of the food products based on their own scoring system, which was called the clear score. Okay. And they say that the clear score is the most accurate and objective food rating system for consumers, which I feel like is saying that they're sharing the most factual facts. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to guess that if you have to tell people that you're the most objective, you likely aren't the most objective. A hundred percent. Also, it just seems so crazy to have this test that you made that's not validated and then be, I don't know, I'm so skeptical. For sure. The test hasn't been reused, my knowledge. So it's not like it was this like innovative. So if it was so perfect, people would have adopted it if they could. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Anyways, they did give a little bit more information into how they calculated this clear score, which was by comparing the molecular contents of foods against their packaging claim. So the higher the score, the more likely that you're purchasing exactly what's on the label. Mm -hmm. However, they don't disclose how they obtain the molecular contents, what contents they're measuring, and what tests they use. So there's just like a lot of gaps, gray area there. Yeah. Yeah. But in this Kickstarter campaign, they raised over $100,000 Canadian, but they were ultimately unsuccessful as they're about $17,000 shy of their goal. Wow. Mm -hmm. They got so close. So close. (laughs) Is this a Canadian company? No, this one's out of LA, but I just put it in Canadian numbers for us. So in the US, I'm guessing in total, they're probably trying to raise $100,000. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But when I was on the Kickstarter campaign website, it showed me in Canadian dollars, which is why. Okay. One other thing to make note of is that Clear Labs published this information as a report, not a study. So in a study, you present your findings on a research topic. So these findings, they're not your own because they're they're facts that you're sharing. Mm -hmm. Whereas a report can include experiences and unique perspectives on a topic So it's more of a subjective investigation than actual objective research as your own experiences may guide you. So in a study, you might answer the question, what is the genetic makeup of this hot dog? And you would report the different types of genetic information that you found in your research. In a report, you might answer a question like, what is the best vegetarian hot dog? And while you may present some research to back your claim, you can also interview people to find out what they think or visit restaurants to find out for yourself or like use just different factors such as like the distance from your location or the cost of the hot dog. Mm -hmm. So there's Mm -hmm. just different factors that kind of come into play with a report versus a study. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in that hierarchy of evidence, a report is down by expert opinion, maybe like the lowest rung for sure. Or even I guess lower. You, you would have more like qualitative information in there, I guess. So I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah. Studies would obviously be top tier. 
report mm-hmm. would likely be below that. It's, Lower. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But it's just something to keep in mind. Like, why didn't they release it as a study if they had studied the products? Because they wanted to copyright their own methods. And for a study, you'd have to describe the methods completely, probably. Exactly. Yeah, that makes sense, too. <laughs> yeah. So as of today, over five years later, both of these instances still remain unproven. So mm-hmm. no research that I could find has shown meat and veggie dogs or human DNA in hot dogs or veggie dogs. So of the news articles that I did find, I also did not see any retractions of this, even though the hot dog Mm. report was taken down by Clear Labs Inc., which to me, this was a little bit concerning because the information does still exist on these news websites, but it just hasn't been corrected. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess like the Clear Labs motivation is still a little bit unclear. Like were they trying to instill fear in the consumer to like raise money for their campaign? Did they even intend for the report to be taken as fact and turned into the the headline that it did become? Oh, how could they not expect it to turn into headlines though? It's so sensational. So sensational. But they were also just starting. The company was just starting. Maybe they didn't think that they would have that much of an impact. For sure. But it just started snowballing. Right. Well, then they should do a retraction. Exactly. Their hot dog report is no longer on their website. It's gone. Which is technically a retraction, but you need to make a statement to the media to be like, this has been misconstrued. Here's what could have gone wrong or what happened. Yeah. And it's possible that exists. I wasn't able to find it, but if I do find it, I'll give you an update. (laughs) You know what the biggest like red flag or the, or the thing I'm so curious about, like when it talks about human DNA it being in the hot dogs, we can tell what kind of DNA is coming from like what body parts. So if it's like hair or fingernails or hygiene related things, so gross, but you would know that versus like, is it human meat? Eyeballs. Yeah. Eyeballs. <laughs> like really gross. Just to say just human DNA leaves a lot for the imagination mm-hmm. <laughs> versus if it's just people not wearing hair nets. Do you know what I mean? It's equally, it's not equally gross. They're both incredibly gross. (laughs) They did mention hygiene in the report. So you would assume that it's those things. But yeah, again, they could have made it more clear, especially if they have that information. But, you know, maybe their methods don't tell you as much information. So how do you feel about hot dogs? I mean, reading this, I was like, ew, this is really gross. And then the Mm -hmm. more I looked into it, I was like, but it doesn't seem to be legitimate. So right. I think the take home message here is that you can keep eating your weenies. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Becca, that was really well done. I am sufficiently grossed out, <laughs> even though it like probably isn't true to the extent that it seemed. I am grossed out just by thinking of all those things. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. It's a little, a little gross, but it's good. I think to clear the air. Yeah, it was always good to clear the air. (laughs) Unfortunately, my story is also gross and a little bit graphic. Mm. And so, horse folks, this is your fair warning that today's story might be a little unsettling. Becca, I don't even know. Are you a horse person? Um, yeah. Like, do you ride horses? uh, When I was a kid, I went to horseback riding camp. (laughs) Oh, so I have a little jewelry box with a horse on it. But uh, am I going to want to sign off during this? Maybe a part. Like, it's pretty... No, I think the research was just really tough because there was, like, videos and stuff. Ooh, and, yeah, okay. But I've done my best to keep this story as listener-friendly as possible. Like, it's not going to be graphic. But it's still... It's just unsettling to think about horses for food products. Which is so strange. And I know we talked about this in the last episode, but how is that? how is that different than a cow or pig? I know. I think if you look at it like objectively large mammal with hooves, how is it different? But when you think about it in terms of like horses are pets, mm-hmm. they're companions, they are, it's just different. I don't know. It's really tough. I do get into it towards the end. So we'll get there, right. get there in a bit. But if it's not obvious yet, this week, I'm going to be talking about the European horse meat scandal, aka horse gate. Dum, dum, Did you know dum. it was called horse gate? No, I didn't. That's cute. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Okay, so this story is really complicated, and there are so many moving pieces. I couldn't have even began to make sense of it myself without the work of Felicity Lawrence, 
who is an investigative journalist for The Guardian that broke this story and covered the entire scandal. And she has some incredible articles on The Guardian. Okay. So just wanted to give her a shout out because <laughs> she really, really helped me. <laughs> she deserves it. So Horsegate was a European food fraud scandal in which products being sold as beef, so frozen burgers, frozen meals, and ready meals, were found to contain undeclared horse meat, in some cases as high as 100% horse meat. Oh my gosh. Like, yeah, and it was it was a really big deal. It started in Ireland. It spread all over Europe. It eventually impacted over 20 countries. It interrupted major supply chains, was responsible for millions of product recalls, and it completely shattered consumer trust in the European food industry. Huh. Yeah, it was wild. But I was unaware of it when it happened. And I almost wish I could be on the ground in Europe in 2013 just to see what like consumer thoughts were. For sure. Quick question. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe this is a stupid question. Does Canada get any meat products from Europe or is it mainly U.S.? I actually don't know if we import from Europe, but I know that uh, this is like such a tangent. But in (laughs) 2007, Canadian horse meat was involved in another scandal related to one of the people who's involved in this scandal. This is a tangled web. We produce a lot of uh, beef, though. Yeah ourselves. So I'm not sure if we import a ton of that. Like Canadian beef is a huge industry. Mm -hmm. Fact check Sarah here. Canada produces 75% of our domestic beef, but of the beef that we do import, 56% comes from the USA, 11.4% comes from New Zealand, and 9.7% comes from Europe. And I think the most frustrating part of this whole story and scandal is that No one was really held accountable in a satisfying way. So there have been smaller convictions for negligence and and smaller cases of fraud, but there hasn't been a notable conviction that would really put consumers' minds at ease. Wow. I feel like food fraud just isn't punished like other crimes. It's not at all. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's like, there's so many pointing fingers, blaming other people. I didn't know what I was buying. I thought I was buying this, but there's not enough checkpoints. And luckily you'll learn that that changed a little bit in Europe after the scandal. Great. Okay. So the horse meat scandal came to light on January 15th, 2013, when the Irish food safety authority was conducting their normal monitoring activities and they tested some frozen beef burgers from some common brands sold by major supermarkets in the UK and Ireland. And of the burgers that they tested, 37% contained horse DNA, aka horse meat. Most of these burgers only had trace amounts, like 1% or less, which is still a little concerning. But one of the burgers, a Tesco Everyday Value burger, contained over 29% horse meat. And... Of course, this was shocking. And that's the number that the media reported widely. In this first initial batch of testing, 85% of the burgers also contained pig DNA. So this was obviously a huge deal. And in the weeks that followed, public outrage spread all across the UK and Ireland. Horse meat is not a part of the food culture in Ireland or the UK. And people were really not happy about finding out that they'd been eating pig or horse without their consent. And it's especially awful because many people in Jewish and Muslim communities eat kosher or halal and intentionally don't consume pork products or horse products. So following this revelation, extensive testing began all across the European Union, where 4,144 samples that were labeled as beef for retail or restaurants were tested. And of those nearly 4,200 samples, nearly 5% contained horse DNA. And another 8,000 samples were collected from various points along the supply chain, so producers, processors, and distributors. And of these 8,000 samples, 1.38% of them contained horse DNA. So we see definitely a a fairly widespread problem, but not a, you know, 30% horse DNA in every burger problem. Right. So just some tainted burgers along the way. Some tainted burgers, but clearly no checks in place to make sure that this isn't happening. Mm -hmm. So in the immediate aftermath of this first revelation, 
The major supermarkets like Tesco and Dunn's began withdrawing the tainted products from shelves through massive product recalls. And this lasted for months as more and more revelations came to light through testing. So what started with just frozen beef patties being the original offender, eventually extended to fresh beef products and ready-made products like frozen lasagna, moussaka, bolognese, and shepherd's pie. As more corporations and organizations began testing their products, it was slowly revealed that horse meat was found in Burger King burgers, some Ikea sausages in Russia, and a fancy supermarket called Waitrose had meatballs that were contaminated with pork. And one particular brand of frozen food called Findus or Findus was selling beef lasagna that tested at 60 to 100%. Oh my gosh, this is giving me like the heebie-jeebies. I, I know, it's a real, it really is kind of repulsive to think about. It's bad. I, I know I had a lot of heebie-jeebies while I was researching. <laughs> okay, so how did this happen? There are a handful of major supermarkets in the UK that the majority of people get their food from. Kind of similar to here, we've got Loblaws, Metro, you mm -hmm. know, the classics, and it's very similar in the UK. And these supermarkets operate under a sole supplier, many buyer relationship, which means that many retailers have either the same supplier or a small number of supplier options. Okay. And those suppliers have a lot of control over what enters the food system. And it kind of, it, it sets the stage for a power imbalance. So where the suppliers have most of the power over the food supply. And this led to a supplier culture that supported greed and unethical decision-making because there weren't really any checks in place. Mm -hmm. And so the meat supply system was primed for crime. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All of these frozen beef burgers that were originally tested originated from three meat plants in the UK and Ireland. And at the heart of those meat plants was APB Foods, which is one of Europe's biggest beef processing companies. The hardest part of this, honestly, was like getting all the names of things straight because I'm not familiar with the different suppliers and the different like grocery stores. Right, right. Like you don't know if you're talking about a supplier or a store. Yeah, like every time a different name would come up, I'd be like, wait, okay, so is this a, a slaughterhouse or is this a grocery store or is this a whatever? Sure, you learned okay, a lot. Okay, so <laughs> I learned so much. When I, if I go to the UK, I'll know where to shop. <laughs> so APB Foods declined. They were a, um, a meat plant, so they owned a bunch of meat plants. Okay. Okay. They declined to share where their burger meat came from. And they said no one in the company has ever bought horse meat and they didn't know that they were putting horse in burgers mislabeled as beef. Okay, so hmm. put a little sticky note on that because you're going to hear that again and again, this I didn't know theme. But they didn't declare to share. They also didn't share, yeah. Hmm. Yep. And it's also important to note that it's actually not illegal to put horse in beef burgers, but it is illegal not to label it as okay. horse. Right? So as long as it says what it is. As long as it says what it is, no problem. Mm -hmm. So why might someone put horse in a beef burger? In a nutshell, it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. And at this time, consumers had cut back their spending in the face of the recession. So retailers were seeking cheaper meat. And at the same exact time, manufacturer costs were increasing because the cost of grain to feed cattle and the energy required for processing were both very high. So there's this huge imbalance between consumer demand and supplier costs. Okay. So at this time, Europe was coming out of the recession and many horse owners were hit hard financially and could no longer afford to keep their horses and end up selling them off, which is really sad. And yeah, so it was kind of the perfect storm of, you know, consumer demand meets high costs of beef meets increased availability, lower cost of horse meat, and you get horse gait. Who is the sick individual that thought of doing this? I'll, I'll tell, tell you. Me. Perfect segue. <laughs> Back to ABP Foods. I find it hard to say that. One of their suppliers was Willie Selton. Willie had a meat factory in a town called Oss in Holland. And two weeks after the scandal broke, he was ordered to recall 50,000 tons of meat that he had sold to 16 different countries because he was unable to show where it had came from. Hmm. 
So our girl Felicity Lawrence comes back. She's the investigative journalist from The Guardian. She actually retraced the entire route of a truck that contained horse meat, and it led her back to Willie Selton. That's amazing. Good for her. Yeah, she's super cool. Dutch authorities alleged that Willie had received 300,000 tons of horse meat over the past few years, and a lot of it had entered the food system, and his books reflected none of it. Hmm. So Willie Selton was arrested in May 2013, and despite maintaining his innocence, he was jailed for 2.5 years for forging documents to sell meat. And this is a quote from Willie, just to give him a little stake in the argument. Quote, I am not the big horse meat swindler they're all looking for. I was careless with my administration, but not intentionally. End quote. Hmm. So he denies it. But unfortunately, I think you need to be very careful with your administration if you're dealing with something like food. Yeah. And I, I feel like with this type of food fraud, and, and I don't know this, this could also maybe be something we look into, but can you be punished for these crimes? Because it looks like he was given 2.5 years for forging documents. And yeah. even last week when we were talking about the, was it the raspberries? Oh no, it was the grains when they were charged with wire fraud. Yeah. So I think that's the real base of this whole problem is that you can't get charged. And we'll have to fact check that for sure. But nobody in this story got charged in a significant way. Mm -hmm. Like with consumer manipulation or yeah. something like that. Fact check Sarah here. And my research is inconclusive. A lot has changed since Horsegate, including industry attitudes, the introduction of rigorous testing and surveillance systems, and the government is more prepared for future incidents thanks to the establishment of the National Food Crime Unit and the Food Industry Intelligence Network. However, I could not confirm if actual laws have changed, so let us know if you know. But there were changes made to the whole system. Like, they set up a food crime unit. I'll tell you about it a little later on, but, mm -hmm. like, they took steps to enforce these things after this. Okay. That's which good. is, so maybe now you can get seriously charged. But back then know. it didn't look like you could. Back then it, it looks like they were kind of, who can we blame for this? Everyone is blaming someone else. And they had very little to actually charge on, hmm. which is interesting because food safety rules are very tight in the UK. They have one of the strictest food safety rules in the entire world. Mm -hmm. But food fraud isn't necessarily food safety. Yeah, that is interesting. It is interesting. It's very interesting. Because they overlap significantly. Okay, so where was Willie getting his meat from? <laughs> Turns out, and this is, I made a note, horse lovers, you can cover your ears maybe. Old, sick horses mm. from, I know, from Northern Ireland were being exported to Scotland and the UK and these horses were being sent to slaughterhouses through an Irish trader who was then selling them to Red Lion Abattoir, who was selling to Willie Selton, who was selling to ABB Feuds. Can okay. you see how this gets so confusing? So Red Lion to Willie to the yeah. AB, APB, ABP? Yeah, ABP. <laughs> okay. A trader in Northern Ireland to Scotland and the UK, and then they're being sent to slaughterhouses, which is the Red Lion Abattoir. So an abattoir, I don't know if you know this, an abattoir is a, is a slaughterhouse. Okay. That's a nice word for a it's slaughterhouse. A, isn't that a <laughs> euphemism and a half? It yeah. sounds like a, like a nice cafe or something. Is that French? What is that? Sounds French. It does. Abattoir. But yeah, no, it's an abattoir is a slaughterhouse. So um, Red Lion. So this is the abattoir that was receiving the old sick horses. They were charged with falsifying passports. Okay. Horses have passports. What? Oh my gosh. With their pictures they, on them? <laughs> I actually don't know. I should have looked one up. We'll get a picture of one. <laughs> and they need them to travel internationally. And they have like, I think they have their medical information and they each have a, a specific number associated with them because horse trading is, it's very tightly regulated. Mm -hmm. So that these illegal horses were making their way into the system uh, was a really big problem. So the Red Lion Abattoir, this is the slaughterhouse has now been closed down by the Food Standards Agency after failing to meet standards for the safe production of meat. And from what I could find online, they haven't reopened yet, but they were never charged in this case. Okay. 
Never. But they were receiving the horses. Yeah. But like they knew, I don't know if there's an instance of fraud here because they knew they were receiving horses. They falsified the, the either they or the trader from before falsified the passports. Okay. But I think there's no like proof of who did what. Okay. Right. I know it's so confusing, but two other men were jailed for their involvement in another part of this scandal. So Adronica Sideros and Ulrich Nielsen were both jailed for 4.5 and 3.5 years, respectively, for a conspiracy to sell 30 tons of horse meat as beef. Sideros's fingerprints were found on suspicious beef labels that were attached to 30% horse meat and 70% beef. And Nielsen was charged because he bought the horse meat and had it delivered to a wholesale meat distributor in North London. So they both got charged. But this was just 30 tons. Before we were talking, it was like, wasn't it 300? Wasn't it like 300,000 tons? Yeah, 300,000. Mm-hmm. That was Willie. Okay, so top of page four, there's a map. Okay, I see it. All we've talked about so far is the blue. Oh my gosh. There's the the red is like a tangled web. You just see how complicated it is. Like it's so hard to keep track of. It's shocking to me that there were this many people involved in this. So many people involved, but it's not like they were all working together. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like right. some of them were where the lines are connected. They were working together, but they might not have ever talked with the, the original traders versus, you know what I mean? So who is the person that made this decision or is it a set of people? Yeah. And how many people are completely innocent and had no idea? So did multiple people come up with this idea that they're going to sell horses as beef? Because that is a weird idea to me. It's a weird idea, but it makes sense if beef, the price of beef is skyrocketing. They look incredibly similar. As, as somebody who's eaten horse, does it taste the same? I honestly don't remember. And it was tartare. <laughs> So it wasn't like cooked. I don't know. The whole thing is so bizarre. It was at a French restaurant that we'll get back into it. But like the horse is eaten in a lot of a lot of cultures and it's a good source of protein. That makes sense. But to us, it's really different. It's not part of our tradition. Mm -mm. OK, let's go on to the, the tangled web of red lines here. All right, I'm ready. So there's a basically the French branch of this scandal, which took a different route than the UK Irish one. So in February 2013, this is a month after it broke in Ireland, the French government makes an announcement that a major meat processing company called Spangaro, which is located in Spain, knowingly sold horse meat as beef to a French company called Comigal. Spangaro had been importing horse meat from Romania, and Romania was properly labeling it as horse meat. And then Spangaro would intentionally relabel it as beef hmm. and resell it to Comigal. Sounds similar to our raspberry scheme. Very similar. And uh, remembering that sole supplier, many buyer relationship, mm -hmm. Comigal was the sole supplier for retailers all across France, Netherlands, Sweden, and the UK. So at this point, what would you say to this? Whose fault is it? Spangaro's for intentionally supplying horse meat and mislabeling it as beef? Or Comiguel, who bought beef at a below market price and didn't verify that it was beef? So Comiguel, though, they didn't know. They say they didn't know. Technically. Okay. Just based on what you said right there, I would say that... Obviously, they're both a little bit to blame, but that Spang, mm. Spangaro, or whatever the company was called. Yeah, I know, me, that's how I'm pronouncing it. <laughs> you're mislabeling. So I feel like that's yeah. where the crime began. That's where yeah. the fraud began. The so, intention. The intention, yeah. So mm -hmm. whether or not Call Me Gal knew if their intention wasn't to sell horse meat, but they didn't verify, I feel like it's not 100% their fault. So not, yeah, for, basically that's exactly true. Although experts do say that there is a different texture, there's a different smell. There's mm. no way anyone who works with beef on a regular basis is getting horse meat and thinking it's beef. Okay. If this isn't confusing enough, there is yet another horse meat supplier. So Spangaro's holding company purchased horse meat from a trader in Cyprus 
who purchased their meat from a Dutch company called Drop. Oh my God. Can you say that again? I'm so lost. (laughs) I know. I know. It's so tough. So Spangaro, Spangaro. which is the Spanish company Mm -hmm. that was supplying the French company Comiguel that supplies like all different countries. Right. Right. So then Spangaro was getting their meat from a trader in Cyprus. Right. Who was getting their meat from a Dutch company called Drap. Okay. But Drap, Drap was producing horse meat as horse meat. Like it wasn't mislabeled at this point. Not so fast. Okay. Sorry. So Drap is actually the Dutch word for horse spelled backwards. Mm, So the Dutch word for horse is prad. Prad. I don't like, sorry for all of my pronunciation in this entire episode. And this company is owned by a guy named Jan Faison, who has a previous conviction for horse meat fraud from 2007. Okay. And Drop was purchasing horse meat from two Romanian slaughterhouses. So again, tracing it back to Romania. Now, there are no charges in this area from this fraud at all. Hmm. No reports of any jail time. So it, I found one article on a web news site that I've never seen before. I wouldn't even necessarily trust its account, but it said that Jan Faison was arrested in 2019 along with four other men, but there was no verdict. So either court proceedings are still in process or charges were dropped. There's almost no information hmm. about this arrest. So yeah, I don't really know what to do with that information, but it just shows, again, holding people accountable is tough. And it's very difficult to identify who are the people that knew something was happening mm-hmm. and who was just being open and honest and, and and doing their trade. Yeah, it sounds like more information keeping is necessary. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And the good news is that it is now. Okay, There are checks and balances in place. So that is actually really it for the arrests. So there's not a huge amount of people being held accountable for a scandal that really rocked Europe. Yeah. So eating horse meat is technically safe and it's a common part of many traditional diets all around the world. But a major concern in this specific scandal was that phenylbutazone could have entered the supply chain for human consumption. Phenylbutazone is often called bute, and it's a painkiller given to horses. And the legal sale of horses, like I said, it's very tightly regulated with passports and medical documents. Mm -hmm. And horses that have been treated with this painkiller, bute, cannot be used for human consumption. Yes. So this is like one of the major concerns that was raised during this whole time. Mm -hmm. So there is no evidence that horses treated with bute entered the supply chain, but there's also no way of knowing definitively. And the good news, I guess, is that even if horses treated with bute did enter the food system, this is another case of the dose makes the poison, which we've talked about a couple times. Mm -hmm. So the UK's chief medical officer at the time, her name is Sally Davies. She said that the level of contamination, 1.9 milligrams per kilogram, posed very little risk to human health. And around 500 to 600 burgers containing 100% horse meat would need to be eaten to receive the daily human therapeutic dose. And does bute do anything negative to humans? It, I actually don't know. Fact check. Fact check, Sarah here. Phenylbutazone or bute was introduced in the 1950s to treat arthritis and other inflammatory musculoskeletal disorders in humans. And that soon extended to horses as well. But by the mid-1980s, bute had been banned from human use in most Western countries due to severe side effects. And the list is long, but it includes edema, nausea, cramps, and in some cases, induction of blood disorders. Okay, so let's talk about how consumers responded overall to this scandal. I have a quote here by Judge Owen Davies, who presided over the Sedaris case. The confidence in the food chain was affected adversely and the share prices of big supermarkets were affected and it's difficult to recreate the feeling of anxiety that the public had at the time this all emerged. So the retailers and the consumers are the real victims here. Consumers responded actually by changing their shopping habits. So a report found that 60% of consumers changed their shopping habits in response to the scandal with 30% 
buying less processed meat and 24% choosing only vegetarian ready-made meals. Organic food sales rose as well, which is kind of cool. Organic foods tend to be seen as a symbol of like integrity, locality, quality. And from January to February 2013, the first month of the scandal, organic food sales rose 8.4%. Uh oh. Opens Just the door immediately for a different type of food. For crime. a different type of, <laughs> totally. I know. So retailers responded with a commitment to purchase more local meat and to tighten up their supply chain and be transparent about the sources for their product. And in the UK, they introduced the red tractor logo to show that the product is fully traceable by independent inspectors. Oh, that's Isn't good. that cute? That is cute. Yeah, I like it. So people could look for that label on their foods and know that it has been traced to its source by an independent ins- inspector, which is cool. That's good. It's all about the independent inspectors. Yeah. You don't want one that works for the, the company. Yeah, not like Clear Labs. No. <laughs> Here's our findings by our secret process, which is the best secret process. With our <laughs> measurements. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so after all these allegations came to light, Professor Chris Elliott from Queen's University in Belfast wrote an extensive review looking at the integrity and assurance of food supply networks across the UK and Ireland. I can't remember if you sent me this podcast. Is it the and milk? And told me to listen. The milk one? Yeah, yeah. Milk Street. Yeah. Okay. He's great. He is so cool. And I think we should try to get him on the podcast someday. All right. How cool would that be? Did you listen when they played the game? Um, what was the game? It oh, was... Yes. yes, I did. Name any food, and I'll tell you what the food fraud is. So the host was like, uh, Parmesan. And Chris Elliott was like, yeah, it's sometimes laced with cardboard. <laughs> but okay, that one actually got me thinking, though, because cardboard comes from trees. So are they talking about the cellulose, oh, cellulose. found in Parmesan? Because that one I was actually a little bit I like, wonder. That That's is, a good point. That is technically disclosed on Parmesan yeah. ingredients labels, like if you have the cellulose in it. That one I was like, I wonder. Um, yeah, that one I was questioning. But he also mentioned coconut at one point, not mm-hmm. during the game. And that's what made me look it up, um, yeah. which I mentioned to you. Was that last yeah. episode or two episodes ago? Because a coconut palm takes eight years Mm -hmm. to produce a coconut. Mm -hmm. And yet coconut oil is sold everywhere so widely right now. Absolutely. It takes me like a couple weeks or a couple months to finish like a jar of it, not eight years. Yeah, Yeah, (laughs) totally. I know. Anyways, he was so, so cool. Um, The UK food industry has some of the strictest food safety policies in the world, but preventing and protecting against food crime was not a key element at this time. Mm -hmm. So the Elliott Review makes recommendations to protect against food fraud based on eight pillars of food integrity. I'm going to list them for you. Okay. Consumers first. That one makes sense. Mm -hmm. Zero tolerance for food fraud and food crime. I mean, that one should also be tied with first. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Intelligence gathering by government and industry, laboratory services for audit, inspection, and enforcement, auditing to identify the risk of food crime, government support, leadership, and crisis management. So basically he laid out this entire review to have mechanisms in place to deal with these sort of things and prevent them from happening, which is, it was so needed, clearly. Following Elliot's review, the UK established the National Food Crime Unit, which is tasked with protecting consumers and the food industry from food crime within food supply chains. (laughs) Canada doesn't have one. And Maybe. neither does the U.S. Oh, really? From what I could find. Huh? Unless it's secret or unless it's part of another major unit. But I couldn't find any dedicated food crime units. Well, maybe this is our opportunity to get involved. <laughs> to form a unit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And that, so the, basically that's, that's it for the scandal. That's kind of the happy ending. A food crime unit was formed. Mm-hmm. Hopefully nothing like this can happen again. People are way more aware of it. But what a icky ride. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And I, I feel like you did a really good job at at telling that story without too many gory details. So I appreciate that. But it is shocking to know that there were so many players involved, like so many players that weren't even involved with each other that were involved in this scandal. Did you ever watch Peaky Blinders? I did not. 
Oh, it, like I just kept thinking of of how Peaky Blinders is because they have this kind of fraudulent, I think, whiskey or rye company and like how many players there are in different places around the world. And like, it just reminded me of that. Yeah. I love that show. You should watch it. Okay. I have a side story though about horse meat. Okay. So eating horse meat might seem really weird and even ethically wrong and repulsive to some of us, but it is a traditional food in many cultures, Mm -hmm. including French cuisine. So in 2011, an episode of Top Chef Canada featured horse meat and outrage ensued. The episode was French themed. Horse meat is fairly common in Quebec because of the French heritage. And the challenge was to cook using different, unique, traditional French proteins. Mm. One chef selected horse. He made a horse tartare. And the judges tasted it. They thought it was fine. It wasn't even really an important part of the show. Barely got screen time. But people were really angry. Media outlets reported it. There was a Facebook page calling for the boycott of Top Chef, which is still up there. You can look at it. Oh, yeah. Over 5,000 followers. I'll yeah. write that down. And the Food Network defended using horse because it's part of a truly authentic traditional French menu. But they did end up pulling the episode from their website. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really interesting. So cultural norms keep horse off the menu in the U.S. and for the most part in Canada, with the exception of Quebec. But there are other reasons why horse isn't common here. Okay. One of them is that slaughterhouses are designed for cattle. So they're designed to be as efficient and humane as possible for cattle, which means that they're not set up to be efficient or humane for horses. Mm -hmm. Just really, I've never thought about that before. And also because old racing horses here have typically been given fennel butazone, so but, which means that they can't legally be used for human consumption anyways. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, there's a major cultural connection to horses, and they're seen as companions similar to dogs or cats. Right. James Serple, he studied human-animal interactions, and he's a professor of animal ethics and welfare at the University of Pennsylvania. He said, quote, There's some interesting things going on in Asia right now with a lot of local resistance to the idea of eating dogs and cats. And there's certainly a cultural shift going on. And it's due to the rise in pet keeping in these countries and the experience of having those animals as family members, which is turning them off the idea of eating them. It would actually make a lot of sense to eat horses. It seems like a terrible waste of protein, but it makes sense to people from an emotional and cultural perspective. And I honestly feel it as well. Like I feel emotionally averse to the idea of horse consumption. I do too. Yeah, I know it's a lot. It's <laughs> This is going to be a, a heavy episode or it has been at least, but that is, that's actually it for the, uh, for the scandal. Wow. I know. Well done. I'm glad I can stop researching it too. There was some really sad stuff out there. I know. I'm surprised that you like the previous vegetarian, were you full vegan yeah. at one point? I was full vegan before school, yeah, Yeah. for a long time. I'm surprised that you took on this topic, to be honest. Yeah, me too. I don't know. It's it's really interesting to learn about. And like, it certainly didn't make me hungry for meat. I can say that. No, I might be eating vegetarian tonight. (laughs) For a little bit, yeah, (laughs) for sure. Yeah, no, it's really sad. And I don't know. It's just twisted to hear all the ways that fraud can sneak into our system. For sure. And I mean, it is better to know about it. I feel like consumer awareness is always key. Yeah. Consumer awareness is key. And at the same time, it's like, what could a consumer have done in this situation to change what happened? Like we consumer awareness, yes, but we need supplier awareness and retailer mm-hmm. awareness and producer awareness. Where are you selling your meat to? Where you know, the, there needs to be awareness throughout the entire chain. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. But on that note, before we do finish off today's episode, I have a little teaser question for the next two weeks. Ooh. Are you ready? Yeah, I am. Okay. I don't know what it is. You don't know what it is. I didn't prep you with this. No, I didn't. <laughs> okay. So when it comes to the holidays or just your day to day, Are you more on team sweet or team savory? I am team sweet when it comes to the holidays, hands down. I'm like typically more team savory, but holiday styles, 
all about the cookies, the squares, the hot chocolates, things like that. What about you? That's a, yeah, that's a good choice. So I find as I get older and I mean, I'm not old, Mm. but like as I age, I am (laughs) more into the savory. I used to be such a sweet person, but I do find that times like right now when I'm stressed with school stuff, I always crave sweet stuff, which is really interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Aw, that's so okay. As I age, air quotes, (laughs) well, I guess we are aging, but it's not a bad thing. (laughs) Everyone's aging. I'm like getting more of a sweet tooth. Really? Yeah, I used to just not really super care about sweets, all about savories, like nachos and things like that. But now I'm like, I just always want sweet stuff. So we're going in opposite directions. We're going in opposites. Anyways, that was the teaser for you. I'm not going to give you any more information. I'm excited. All right. Until next time. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Dietetics After Dark. You can find all the references and materials used to put this podcast together in our show notes at thenutritionjunkie.com slash dietetics after dark. This is an independently produced podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love it if you would rate, review, and subscribe to our show. For more information, follow us on Instagram at dietetics after dark. If you have an idea for an episode or segment, email us at dietheticsafterdark at gmail.com. This podcast was recorded and edited by Earworm Radio. We highly recommend their services for all of your podcasting needs. You can learn more about Earworm Radio at earwormradio.com.